Amen. All right. Now I'm going to get back to this passage in a little bit, but um, just as way of introduction, I'm sure that nobody in this room this morning is pleased with the way that our country is going, right? The way that the world is going, just the, the wickedness that's heading, that, that's been getting worse and worse and worse. Nobody's happy with that. And with so much of this wickedness that's abounding, it could be easy to get discouraged because you think that like, oh, you know, I'm trying to do what's right and the world just is just getting worse and worse and worse. And it's easy to, to, to just get overwhelmed and think, how can we possibly deal with all of these different things that are going on from all fronts? It's like there's an attack on Christianity from all fronts. The family's being attacked. The, you know, the promotion of abortion and sodomy and, and, and fornication and adultery. There's just so many things are just being attacked. And it seems like it's coming in from all sides and it's all at once. And it becomes very difficult to understand how you individually can have any impact on this world. You think, well, I'm just one person. How can I do anything about this? And, and, and I think people might have a tendency to just kind of throw their hands up in the air and say, this is too much for me. I can't, I can't handle this. I can't do anything about it, so just forget it. And that is, the, that is the not the right attitude we need to have. You know, um, and we'll, we'll get into this in a little bit. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. But a lot of people will think, okay, we have all these problems in the world, so how are we going to fix it? And I was actually one of these people, and we are just talking about this yesterday. A lot of people look to elections, and they'll think, you know, the world, um, this is one of the solutions that the world's going to offer you, right? This is, this is what the best that the world will come up with. And they'll say, at least in this company, uh, co company, this country, many people will think, you know, if we can just get the right people elected into office, then things will be much better. We'll get, you know, we'll get someone and they'll make these laws and they'll make this stuff illegal and then we'll get back to the way things used to be. And, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of people that are happy, you know, this week because we had the midterm elections and now the Republicans are in control of the, the Senate and the House of Representatives and now everything's just going to be better. Right? All this wickedness they're seeing. Now the world's problems, were, they're just going to go away because we got the right people in our government. Not even close. And I, I, I want to shake people sometimes. Think, is your memory really that short? It was just, I mean, what, eight years ago maybe when, when the Republicans did have control of like everything in government? And what happened? Did they do anything to stop any of the wickedness that's going on. And, and you think, you know, Republicans, the reason why people like Republicans so much, and I'll tell you what, I'm not a Republican, I'm not a Democrat, I'm not any of that stuff, because right now there is no difference between the two, and they're all just corrupt thieves and liars is what they are. And I don't stand for any of them because they're all wicked. But the last time, and people have this, this false view because they get fed by the, by the media, by the news, into this paradigm of just thinking, well, you're either you're Republican or Democrat, and those are your choices, and that's it. And, and people put so much stock and faith in these men that are just, get, if they're not corrupt, they get corrupted by the time they get into whatever office they hold. And you think about the last time that they were in charge of the government, did they even do anything? They, they all stand on this platform of, oh, I'm pro-life. I'm against abortion. I'm pro-life. Did any one of them do it? They didn't do anything to pass any laws. When they had the power, they could have done it to stop the murder of the innocent children in this country. Not nothing. But they'll all say, they'll give the lip service and say, oh, yeah, I'm pro-life. I'm against abortion. I'm also, well, you get me elected uh, and we'll make some changes and we'll, we'll make sure this gets out. It's a bunch of hot air. They can't do anything because they don't really believe in it. They're a bunch of crooks. I looked up this statistic, and, and it sickens me, but we have to do this from time to time. In 2011, and I found this on the internet, and you, know, you might find varying statistics, but they're all really close enough anyways. When you talk about numbers this large, the variance doesn't matter when it's, if it's 1.06 million or 1.02 million. Now, I understand that's a lot of people, but we're talking millions. This is one year, 
one year in the United States, not across the whole world, one year in the United States. In 2011, approximately 1.06 million abortions took place in the United States. And that's down. That's just down from an estimated 1.21 million abortions in 2008. And it continues. 1.06, you know, I'm trying to get, it's hard to get our mind wrapped around a number so big. Because that's huge. 1.06 million in one year. I have a list here. I looked up the, the population of cities in Arizona. And just so you know, Prescott Valley, where we're at, the town we're in, Prescott Valley here, and these are a little bit older numbers. Again, I don't think this is from 2013 or, you know, it's just a couple years. It's about the same time frame as this, as this statistic, about 2011, of the abortions. Prescott Valley is around like 40,000. Well, yeah, Prescott City is, is 39,000 people. Just 39,000. I have a list of all of these cities in Arizona starting with Flagstaff, Goodyear, Lake Havasu, Buckeye, Casa Grande, Sierra Vista, Maricopa, Oro Valley, Prescott, Bullhead City, Prescott Valley, Apache Junction, Marana, El Mirage, Kingman, Queen Creek, Florence, San Luis, Sawarita, Fountain Hills, Nogales, Douglas, Eloy, Payson, Somerton, Paradise Valley, Coolidge, Cottonwood, Camp Verde, Chino Valley, Sholo, Sedona, Winslow, Safford, Globe, Page, Tolson, Wickenburg, Youngtown, South Tucson, Snowflake, Bisbee, Guadalupe, Litchfield Park, Benson, Holbrook, Cave Creek, Eager, Thatcher, Colorado City, Pine Top, Lakeside, Taylor, Clarkdale, and Dewey. This adds up to about 1.06 million people. This is every city in Arizona besides the Phoenix Metro and Tucson. In one year, imagine all the people in those cities just dead. Everybody wiped out. Ghost towns across Arizona. That's how many babies were murdered in one year. So just wrap your mind around it. Think of all these cities you see in Arizona. Phoenix would be like the only place standing. That's how much 1.06 million is. Those are all innocent lives that were cut short before they even had a chance to be born. And God is angry when the innocent blood is shed. Yes, they have the, the innocent blood is being shed every single day in this country. And these stinking politicians do nothing about it. We can't put our faith in these politicians to do anything about this. If we're going to make any change, it's going to have to come in the heart of the individuals of this country because it's the people's heart that has gotten wicked. And ultimately, it boils down, I blame the churches. Okay, the churches in America have gone soft. The pastors have just been more concerned about filthy lucre, preaching for filthy lucre's sake, instead of just preaching the truth and standing on what's right. The reason why our country is, has gotten so debased is because nobody's been standing up. Nobody has been shining the light. Nobody has been preaching the word. At least not nearly enough. And it's, not, it's not gone completely, but it's gotten very dim. The light in this country has gotten very dim. And you know what? I believe, I personally believe the politicians are just going to be a reflection of the people anyways. So getting some, because here's the thing, all they care about is garnering the votes so they can get in power, right? So they just say the things that they think people want to hear. They don't have any conviction. They don't care about this stuff. They're just going to say, well, let's see, in my district, in my area, what do people want to hear? And that's what I'm going to promise them. And that's what I'm going to tell them that I'm going to do. And that's what I stand for. That's what your politicians do. And they don't care. They don't change anything. But, but what they are is just that reflection. The reflection of, of the, the, either the, the goodness or the wickedness of the people. And you look around at the world today and you wonder why, like, oh man, those, you know, these crooks and these, these politicians in Congress, they're so bad and they're so evil and everything else. Well, you know what they are? That's just, that's just what's going on in all the lives of, these, of the individuals in this country. They're just reflecting how, and, and you, it, it, it's no shock. Look at, look at the multi-million dollar movie industry. Look at the things that sell. Look at the things that people want to see. Look at, look at what people are using for their entertainment. 
Look at, look at what people's interests are at. Look, and look at the statistics like this as the, as the numbers go up, as, an, as, as the divorce rate goes up, as, as morally speaking, everything goes downhill. Of course, we're going to have bad politicians in office. It's just a reflection on the society. It's a reflection on the culture. So, and, and I was saying this yesterday. We're talking about this. You know, I, I was a little misguided. Um, I had a good desire, a good heart to want to change things. You see things in the world and you think, you know what? I'm sick of this. I'm going to have a family. I want my kids to grow up in a, in a clean, wholesome place. We don't need all this wickedness. So my plan for a little while was to get involved in politics. I think, you know what? Maybe I could change something. Maybe I could do something good. I can get in and make a difference. But that's not the answer. It's not. Because, like I said, it, for one, holding biblical views, if the culture is wicked and they hate God already, they're not going to elect you. you know, <laughs> I could be standing, you know, I'm, gonna, we're, we're, I'm really going to do something about this. We're going to change it. People are going to be like, no. We don't, we don't want that. We need, to, we need to reach the hearts. We need to change what's on the inside first so that you can get more people to want what's right. And then, and then I think the, the politics, everything else will follow as a result of individuals' hearts being changed. If you want to make a real difference, it's not going to be found in politics. I, I came to this conclusion, which is actually the reason why I'm even standing here before you this morning. That desire to, to want to do something, to want to make a change, it doesn't come through the, through the polls. It doesn't come through the, through the politics, but it's going to come through reaching people, and it's going to be reaching people with God's Word. We need the truth of the Bible to shine through into people's lights, it, hearts, <clears throat> the light from the Bible to shine into people's hearts and to get them saved and to get Jesus in their heart before we're going to see any major changes in the culture of our society. Now, um, we have a mission in this church. And this is what we're preaching about is our mission. What is the mission of our church? Because that was all just by way of introduction. But um, you think about missionaries. They get sent out of churches, right? A missionary gets sent out. And their mission is usually very well defined. They're going to a specific geographic region, you know, a specific city in another country. And... Their mission is to, it or should be, to preach the gospel, to win souls, and to form churches so that people in these other lands where, where Christianity is not very widespread and there's, there's, there's no churches can, can congregate and learn about God and, and continue to grow and, and, and spread that light. That's their mission. Now, our, our mission is really not much different than that except for the area. We're not traveling off to a distant land. We're doing that very thing here. What we need to do is focus on our community. Missionaries, they're great. I love them. I, I'm thank, praise God that they go out to these other places in the world to do this. But it's, that's not just the work for them to do. That's the work for every Christian. Now, they just happen to be taking it to, to another geographic location. But that's something we all need to be involved in. Yeah. Our mission field is right here in Prescott Valley. Word of Truth Baptist Church, this is our mission field. And, and you know, we need to have that type of a mindset. And unfortunately in churches, they, people have a, have a tendency to relieve the, the responsibility of preaching the gospel because they say, well, I give money to give to our missions who go out and preach the gospel. And they go out and do this work. No, you need to be doing it. Hey, yeah. sure, support them. Give them the money. Great. Amen to that. But don't let that alleviate the responsibility that you have individually to go out and preach the gospel because our mission field is right there. Hey, you want to support people on other mission fields? Great. Keep doing it. I, I'm, I'm not against that at all. We collect a missions offering on Wednesday nights, and I am fully supportive of that. But you have to understand, and you have to get this mindset that you are on a mission field. It's not just someone in a far country. You are on a mission field. This is our mission. This is our job. We are responsible for this area because we're not sending anyone out. We've already been sent out to do the work that's involved here of preaching the gospel and, and getting the word out. I've had a lot of people ask me when I've gone out soul winning, you know, talking to people in the community, knocking on doors. They'll say, you know, why did you decide to start a church in Prescott Valley? And they said, there's so many churches. And there are. There's a lot of churches here. If you drive up the, the road here, um, right outside of our neighborhood, there's like 
four churches, I think, just, just stacked right next to each other. There's another one across the street. I mean, there's churches all over the place. And I've had people ask me, I said, why, why did you start a church in Prescott Valley? Now, I've run into a lot of nice people in this town. There's, there's, there's a lot of really friendly people and a lot of people that are saved. Um, there's definitely a higher percentage of people that are saved here than, than in Phoenix and in other areas I've been to. However, there, there's still something lacking. And I'll tell you what, the devil is hard at work in this town. And just since I've been here, I've had people bringing false gospels to my door on multiple occasions just within the past year. The Jehovah's Witnesses are, are out. The, the Mormons are out. Even the Pentecostals are out. I mean, it's Pentecostals going around and, and, and preaching their, their false gospel of salvation. Now you need to get saved over and over and over and over again. And, and they're going out and doing the work. But you know what? I have not had one person come with, the, with just the simple message, the gospel of Jesus Christ of salvation, come to my door since I've lived here. Now, I'm not saying there aren't any churches that believe right here. I don't know. Maybe they exist. I haven't really come across them. Um, I'm not saying there, there aren't churches that go around and preaching the gospel. I, I, haven't, I haven't seen them. I haven't witnessed them. But I've been here for a year. And if there are, I'll tell you what, I also haven't really run, out, run into anyone out soul winning that has salvation right and that their church goes out and preaches the gospel. So a lot of people, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of people here that are saved. There's a lot of people I talk to, and, and, it's, and it's, to me, it's kind of abnormal running into people like, wow, man, you're like, you, know, you ask them about the, if, if they're saved, you ask them if they know for sure they're going to heaven, they say yes, you ask them why, well, faith is in Jesus Christ, I ask Jesus into my heart, I receive Jesus as my Savior, and you ask them about eternal security, you're like, oh yeah, of course, no, you can never lose it, I'm saved, you know, it's done, and they, and they know when they got saved, and it, you know, they have a great testimony, and there's a lot of people like that here, but when you ask them, say, oh, cool, what church do you go to? And they go to various churches, you know. There's a few that, that, I'm, that I know of that, that typically when someone's saved, okay, yeah, you go to this church or that church. But without fail, ask them, so, you know, does, do you guys go out and, you know, preach the gospel? Do you, do, you, do you go door to door? Do you do anything like that? No. A lot of them say, no, I mean, we probably should, but no, we don't. This is lacking. This is, this is a huge area that's lacking. And... These churches are just going to die. And this is the reason why I believe what, what's happening here is what has already happened all across the country. You get people who get too comfortable, too relaxed. They, they enjoy their church. And especially in a small town, you, you, know, you kind of get to know people and you're just comfortable here. And when the pastor's not leading the church to go out so and to go out and knock on doors and continuing trying to get people saved, people get comfortable. Okay, we're saved. And then... The next generation, well, people don't really know how to give the gospel that well anymore. So you have a lot less people getting saved and it and just continues on. Nobody's going out. There's nothing new being taught. There's nothing, no new people being brought into the church through getting them saved, through giving them the gospel. And it just ends up dying. And this is what has happened in this country is that the soul winning has gone out the window. People have gotten lazy and the churches just begin to die. And that's why we're here. That's why this church exists in Prescott Valley. I know there's tons of other churches you could go to, but not one of them that actually has the right gospel is going out and doing the work. And this is what, what our mission, this is what our job is here. We have a job to do. And Lord willing, Word of Truth Baptist Church is going to be filled with people that love God, that are willing to fulfill that great commission that we just read here in Matthew 28 of preaching the gospel and making disciples and getting people on board and, and teaching them the truth. And uh, let's look real quick at Matthew 28 here at the very end of the chapter where we, where we started off reading. He says in verse 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. So that first word is go. We need to go. We're not the church isn't designed to bring people into the church to get them saved here to walk down an aisle and receive Christ. No, we need to go out. The church is for the saved. The church is to edify the saints and, and to, to learn the word of God. We need to go, therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. 
it doesn't just stop with the soul getting saved. It doesn't just stop there. We need to, to continue with people to, to get them on board, to get them baptized. So the first step is salvation, right? We preach the gospel. Hey, you need to get saved today. You need to put your faith in Jesus Christ today. When a person does that, that's not the end. You know, just, it's not okay. Bye. Look, we need then, now you need to get baptized. Okay, look, you're saved. Amen. Praise the Lord. You're going to go to heaven when you die. But your next command, the next thing you need to do is get baptized. And that's what he's saying here. This is, this is Jesus Christ's commandments to us. I'm not just making this up. He says, go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost. We need to be doing this. Baptizing people. We need to, to get it in people's minds. Hey, look, now you need to get baptized. And then after they get baptized, they have to get in a church where they could learn, where it says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. We need to, to teach people to observe all things. We don't just pick and choose. And it's not just a lopsided thing where we only focus on the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's only death, burial, resurrection. That's all we care about. It's all we do. No, that's the most important thing. But that's not all there is to it. There's a lot more to it. This is our mission as commanded by Jesus Christ. This is what we're here to do. This is the main objective. And this is something we need to keep fresh in our minds over and over again. Now, we preach all kinds of different messages here. There's all kinds of information in the Bible. We preach on sin. We preach on love. We preach on everything that's written in this book. But what we always need to keep in our mind is our mission, our objective. Don't lose sight of the goal. Because everything that we talk about, everything that we learn ultimately is to promote this goal. We need to be bringing this, this light that lightens the hearts of people into our community. We need to, le to win, to lead souls to Christ. And we need to cleave and love God's word and be examples of how Christians ought to be. Now, turn if you would to 2 Corinthians now, turn if you want to Ezekiel, sorry, go, go to Ezekiel, Ezekiel 22. It's important that we don't get overwhelmed. There's, there is a lot of work to be done. You know, there's a lot of doors to knock. And <laughs> I, I, I could preach this to myself as much as anybody. We had so many people out yesterday knocking on doors, and, and we covered quite a bit of ground. But... And when it's just like one or two people, or just Sebastian and I going out soul winning every week, like, do you know how long that area would take yeah. for us to, like, because we, we accomplished a lot yesterday. It was amazing. And that's, and that's why we had 21 souls. Say, hey, that's part of the reason. I mean, we covered a lot of ground and we're out for many hours with a lot of people out doing the work. But for one person, you think about this yourself, and, and, and I've had a lot of experience with this. But we're all human. We need to make sure you don't get overwhelmed. You know, we, we can do, and we work on like the same street sometimes for a couple weeks. And obviously it's a good thing, especially if you're getting in conversation with people and people are getting saved. But I mean, you could cover very little ground. And when there's not many people doing the work, it's a lot easier to get overwhelmed. But you need to just keep plugging away. You need to just keep going. It's, it's, it's not something that you need to be focused on in the short term and say, oh, well, I tried this out for a week or I tried this out for a year and, you know, yeah, it was okay, but nothing seems to be changing. You can't look at those. Th these results are going to have to take a generation. It took a generation for, for the morality to, to really slip and get to the point where we are now. And I'll tell you what, the, the decline is always faster than going uphill. Going downhill is always a lot faster. And, and, and this, this downward spiral of wickedness that our country's heading into, it's just gonna pile up and snowball pine until it get worse and worse and worse. We have an uphill battle. Just as Jonathan did. Jonathan had an uphill battle, but he, uh, but he had faith. See, we, we can't get overwhelmed and think, oh, well, I'm just one person, what can I do? Or even, I'm not very good at this, I'm not a good speaker, I'm, you know, I don't, I don't have very good skills, communication skills, whatever it may be. Don't get overwhelmed. Don't feel defeated. In 2 Corinthians 12, 9, you know, the Apostle Paul, or God, basically Jesus said unto Paul, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. 
He said, my grace is sufficient for thee. That was when Paul was entreating God. He had, he had a thorn in the flesh, and, and he was asking God to help him out with that. And he says, look, my strength is made perfect in weakness. So whatever your shortcomings are, whatever, whatever problems you have uh, as a Christian, whatever you think you're lacking, if you just give God everything you have, whatever that may be, he'll, he'll use it. And he'll be able to use it, he says, not only is he going to use it, he likes to use it. Like that, that's what God enjoys doing. He enjoys using people who, who can't speak very well to get the job done. He enjoys that because it just gives that much more glory and credit and honor unto God. Then it's, it's not just relying on your own personal skills. You're relying on what God's able to do for you. And, and God likes using that. So don't think that like, oh, well, I don't have very good skills, so I can't do this job. No, God really wants to use you. Ezekiel 22, look at verse number 29. Because oftentimes he's just looking for one person. He doesn't need a whole army of people to do great deeds. Sometimes he's just looking for one person. Ezekiel 22, look at verse 29, it says, The people of the land have used oppression and exercised robbery and have vexed the poor and needy. Yea, they have oppressed the stranger wrongfully. This looks like a pretty bad state. Right, a pretty bad state of affairs. The people of the land. This is living in a wicked country. They've used oppression. They're oppressing the people. They're, they're robbing people. They're vexing the poor and needy. Bad state of affairs. They've oppressed a stranger wrongfully. Verse 30, And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. But I found none. He says, I sought for a man. He's looking for just one person. Look, the whole land is full of wickedness. The whole land is full of sin. But he's saying, look, I'm just looking for that one person to stand up, to, to make up the hedge, to fill the gap. He said, look, I could use one person to do mighty things for me. Don't get overwhelmed. Yes, we live in a land of wickedness. We live in a land where the poor and the needy are being vexed. We live in a land where, where there is oppression and, and there's robbery going on. I look at my paycheck and there's a lot of robbery going on. Okay? And, and there is oppression. And, and the more wicked and sinful a country becomes, the worse it's going to get. But God can use just one man. We want to try to stay this judgment that's going to come against this nation. I know I do. I want to stay. I want that, that judgment to be, to be pushed off a little bit. Amen. I want to try to make this a place. You know... I, Something has to, something's going to have to happen. God is historically, we see in the Bible, as, as judge countries over and over and over again for doing the same exact sins that, that we've gotten ourselves into as a whole. It's going to happen. But we also see plenty of examples where people can push off that judgment and say, you know what, we're, we're going to hit the reset button. We're going to get things back on track, God. And, and if the judgment comes, you know, it's going to come. But, but just... Let's just push it off a little while longer. And um, we see here, I mean, he was looking for just one man, and he found none. And, and, you know, it's easy to just say, oh, well, what can I do? And I'm sure this land was probably full of people that, that were just thinking the same exact thing. Well, what, what can I do? And they didn't offer themselves up to say, you know what? Okay, I don't know what I can do. I know what you can do, God. I, what, what can I do? I can do nothing. If I'm just going to start a work and do it in, in my own flesh and just of my own strength and my own power, I couldn't do anything. I would have very minimal impact. But if I'm offering myself up to God and saying, God, just use me. Use me. I'm, I'm going to do, I'm going to yield up myself to you. I'm going to offer you this living sacrifice. Do with me what you will. And, and if you're willing to listen to what God has to say, and, and be used of him, you can do great things. And I mentioned Jonathan with that uphill battle. In, uh, you don't have to turn there, but in 1 Samuel 14, 6, the Bible says, And Jonathan said to the young man that bare his armor, Come and let us go over unto the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. God's not restrained. The only thing that restrains God is us is our lack of faith, our, our, our lack of just trusting in Him to do a great work. God's not restrained by these things. God's all-powerful. He can use it. And, and that's what He did here in this story. Um, you had the Philistines. There was this, this, this battle. They were, they were waiting 
to fight and and uh, it was a, it was a huge host a huge battle array of the enemy in front of him and Jonathan just said look let's go up to these people you know the, the, he calls them the uncircumcised these heathen you know these people who don't believe in God look we've got God on our side we know that we're fighting for the Lord we're in a good fight and in church today that's where, where we're at we have the gospel of Jesus Christ we have the truth on our side we are fighting the good fight Amen. we have nothing to be worried about we have nothing to be ashamed of. We have God's strength with us. So if you know that God's going to strengthen you, if you know that God's with you, hey, who could be against us? Amen. Use that as a source of encouragement. Use that as your source of strength. When you feel weak, when you get tired, when you get weary, when you go out and nobody wants to listen to you, and everybody's shutting you down, keep moving forward. Just know, hey, look, I know I'm doing what's right. If you know you're, you're doing, essentially, obviously we're all saying this, but you know you're doing what God wants you to do, God's with you. Okay? You, you don't necessarily see all the results immediately, but He is with you. Keep pushing forward. You're going with God's strength, not with your own. God's not restrained. He can do all things. I want, I want people to get excited about the things of God. This is another one. This is one of my personal missions for this church. And I pray God will use me to do that, to stir up souls and to stir up spirits. We had a great day yesterday. You know, I'm preaching to people who I know already love God. Everybody that's here today was, I mean, is involved in, in preaching the gospel unto others. And we had a great day yesterday. I'm so thankful for everyone that's here today. But even people who are in it now, I, I've seen it too many times. You, people get plugged into church and they love soul and they go out and they do the work. And after a while, some people fade away. It happens. And what happens, usually people get burned out or they get discouraged or dismayed. And I don't want that to happen. We need, we need to get excited about the things. Don't just, you know, a lot of people, especially when you're new Christians or new to sowing, new to these things, it's all fresh and it's new and it's exciting. Well, the newness wears off. But we need to be able to continue moving forward and continue in God's way. Because look, if you, if, if you are someone that this is brand new to you, you're, you know, you've only gone out for a little while, maybe even less than a year of, of going out, knocking on doors, preaching the gospel to people, you see the excitement there. You know, it's great talking to people. You're still, you're still learning a lot probably, um, getting better at, at talking to people, learning more of your Bible, learning more scriptures. It's all exciting. You're going to reach a point where you start to kind of level off in that growth. <laughs> And this happens all the time. You just kind of level off and things just, you kind of fall into a pattern and a, and a routine. And um, that's when you're kind of susceptible to just thinking the things aren't as exciting. And maybe you get overwhelmed. Maybe you hit a, a bad patch. Maybe you got something else come up in your life and it distracts you. And, and usually that's just going to be Satan's attack to get you out, to get you out of the fight. We have an uphill battle and it's hard work. And there's no doubt about that. But we need to keep ourselves excited and motivated about the things of God. Look at all the great stories in the Bible that people had faith that were used by God to do so many incredible acts. Keep reading the Bible because this should encourage you. There are so many examples here for our benefit of other men that went before us that we can look to as, and, and get excited about and, and to use as a source of strength. So many men of faith that used by God to do so many incredible acts. You think about the, the book of, you know, the, what Moses did and all the, the mighty miracles that were done by his hand. It's extremely exciting. And the reason why it's exciting is because it's real. This isn't just a storybook. This isn't just a fairy tale. These things really happen. God has that power. God had that power back then and God's hand is not any weaker today than it was 2,000 years ago or 4,000 years ago or 6,000 years ago. God is able to perform those same miracles today, but it's going to be relying on us. He still is a God of miracles, but he's looking for us to yield ourselves to him. He's looking for us to just, to just give him what he had. Here am I, Lord, send me. I'm going to do what you want me to do. The only thing that prevents God from performing miracles is us. Um, turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 13. I'll read for you from Psalm 78, verse 40. Psalm 78, 40 says, How oft did they provoke, me, provoke him in the wilderness and grieve him in the desert? Yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited 
the Holy One of Israel. God doesn't limit Himself. We limit Him when we don't have faith in Him, when we don't believe Him, when, when we you know, aren't living for Him. We limit Him. And in Matthew 13, look at verse 58. This is talking about Jesus Christ. It says, And He did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. And you remember He said, If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you say unto this mountain, Be removed, and, and, and it'll do it. You know, and that, that's a, a poor paraphrase of that scripture but he um you know we could move mountains if we have just a little bit of faith in christ and jesus christ isn't a liar he's the one that said that and you could read that and say oh well, that just sounds like an exaggeration no it's not that's not an exaggeration jesus christ himself didn't do many mighty works in an area because people just didn't believe they're just they doubted him they're just saying oh yeah and you know especially in his own country Right? He says, the prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and among his own people. They're like, oh yeah, this Jesus, we know, we know him. He grew up here. We, you know, he's nothing special. And they didn't, they didn't have the belief, so he didn't do the many miracles. And a lot of people think, well, if they didn't believe, then why didn't he do more miracles? To make him believe. That's not how God works. He doesn't do the miracles first just so you can believe. He says, no, look, believe me. I'm telling you this. Trust me. You believe in me. Then you get to do, have the power to do the, the, the mighty miracles. And um, God can do these things today, but we need to remain faithful and we need to just trust that he is capable of doing these things and we need to offer ourselves up and say, here am I, God. I want you to use me. Our mission is to get souls saved and to do God's work. Now, how are we going to accomplish that? And this is going to get into now like, why everything ties together. Right When we come to church and we hear different sermons preached, it's all with this main objective in mind. So when we preach hard about sin, for example, we preach about things, you say, well, what does that have to do with soul? And what does that have to do without getting people saved? Well, that has to do with getting ourselves clean in a vessel that's meat for the master's use. If God wants, if you want God to use you, you need to be an instrument that, that is going to do the job you know, to its utmost performance. You, need, you know, Think about... Um, I don't know, a lawnmower, right? Like if, if you have a lawnmower, it's all rusted out and there's no oil in it. You need, get, you, know, you need all these different things for it to work and function and do its job properly. So yeah, it's a lawnmower. It's, it's, its job is to cut grass. Well, it needs to be maintained. It needs, it needs to have everything in the right place and all the pieces you know, bolted down, tightened up, and, and moving right. It, it's the same thing with us as Christians. Hey, your job is a soul winner. Right? Your job is to go out and win souls. But you need to be well-oiled. You need to be in a place where, where you can be ac actually used to do the job that you're supposed to do. And one of the ways we do that is by getting the sin out of our life. Turn, if you would, to 2 Timothy chapter 2. This is why it's so important for us to, get, to, to focus on getting the sins out of our life and living a holy life is so that we can be used to do great things for God. 2 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 19. The Bible reads, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. See, in order to, to be used of God to do the good works, we need to be prepared unto every good work. We need to be a vessel unto honor. And the way we do that is in the beginning of verse 21 is to purge himself from these, purge ourselves from those sins, get those sins out of our life. That's how we're going to be sanctified. The word sanctified means we're going to be set apart. We're going to be removed from, from this world. We're going to be removed from the things of this world, sanctified, set apart, and meet. The meet just means like you're ready for the master's use. We're ready to go for God. When we start getting all the sins out of our life, hey, now you're going to be someone whose light is going to shine that much brighter because the darkness of sin isn't, isn't clouding your light. And um, turn, if you would, the last place we're going to go to is Romans chapter 12. Romans 12. We're almost done. It's a shorter sermon today. Romans 12 verse 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, 
acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So he says here to present your bodies. This is what we're doing. We're offering up ourselves up as a living sacrifice. We don't do the, the lamb sacrifice. We don't do the bullock sacrifices anymore. That's all from the Old Testament. But now the sacrifice that we offer is our bodies. We offer ourselves. God, here we are. And he, so he says, holy. Holy is basically sanctified. We're, we're, we're removing ourselves from the things of this world. We're getting the sin out of our life. We're presenting ourselves as, as a proper sacrifice. If you're going to give something to God, hey, make it as good as possible. Make it, give it the best that you can. We're going to give our bodies as a living sacrifice. Hey, let's get all the sin and wickedness out of our life so that it could be holy and acceptable unto God so he can look at us and say, okay, this is someone that I want to use. This is someone that I can use to do some great things. Now, we want to complete our mission. As a church, we want to reach the maximum number of people. We want to win the maximum number of souls and teach the maximum number of people to be zealous and, and to do, um, just to be excited about the things of God. And that's the mission for our church. This is our goal. So when we hear the preaching on the, on the sins, it's to make you a better soul winner. It's to make you meet for the master's use. When we hear, you know, we learn other doctrine, when we learn other, other truths from the Bible, Again, it's going to help you to reach souls because there's a lot of people that have a lot of questions about things and we ought to be able to, to provide an answer for that. The more knowledge that you have, the more understanding you have, the, the, the more, you know, there's, a, there's a, all kinds of different people out there, right? When you go and preach the gospel, there's some people who don't know much of anything about the Bible. That's a lot easier because then it's just you focus on the basics. I mean, you're going to, you're going to, everyone needs to hear the gospel. Everyone that's unsaved needs to hear the truth about Jesus Christ. But there's some people who have heard a lot more things and they might have other questions and other stumbling blocks and other things that are kind of preventing them. You know, maybe they don't know as much about Jesus being God in the flesh and, and they've been taught all kinds of false doctrines. Well, the more you learn and the, and the more you learn from the Bible, the more you go to church and, and read the Bible on your own and, and you gain this understanding, it's going to help you then to win those people over to Christ because you're going to know more of the Bible for yourself. So there's, there's all these different aspects when you come to church that help to make you ultimately a better soul winner, even if you don't realize it at the time when you're sitting here and say, oh, well, we're, we're hearing a, a sermon about how men and women are different and how they, they have their different roles and stuff. What does that have to do with soul winning? Well, it actually has a lot to do with soul because the, the, the more you're being obedient to God's word, the more he's going to be able to use you. And the more you learn about the Bible, you'll be able to answer other people's objections a little bit better and hopefully guide them into the truth. Now, that's the, 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 the mission of our church. And, you know, if, I, if I'm just relying on my flesh, I, I do a hard, it's going to be a hard time for me to get people motivated. But... Um, I'm trusting that God's going to going to use our church to get people excited to read these stories and to get excited about about the same God that was able to use these men to do these great things in the book of Acts and and in the Old Testament is still alive today and um He's willing and able to do these things but besides the church's mission you need to have a, a individual mission for your own life Whatever that may be, um, not just the church you belong to, but just individually, you need to make this decision for yourself. See, we go out to reach individuals, but you as an individual need to make that, that decision for yourself. I know that, that when I'm greeted by God in heaven, I want him to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I want him to say to me, look, you know, thanks for all the work that you put forward to me. And, um, you know, decide for yourself, what is your mission? What is your goal? What is your objective? And hopefully it, it lines up with the church's objectives, and, um, which is to go out and, and to be a good soul winner for Christ. Because, you know, I, I talk to people so much about the importance of going out and winning souls. It's one thing for you to sit here and be saved and be like, yeah, I'm saved. I'm going to heaven when I died. And they think, like, that's it. Like, I'm saved. It's, I'm good. What about everybody else? I mean, it's, you, could, you could sit there and say, well, yeah, you're fine. Well, lock yourself in, in your house and, you know, what good does that do to anybody? Someone had to give you the gospel. We need, we need to, you know, in a, in a way, repay that and go out and, and lead others to Christ. But okay. decide for yourself what your, you know, what your mission is and get yourself in the Bible. And, and, you know, don't get overwhelmed, I guess is kind of the, the main point. Don't get overwhelmed with the wickedness in this country. 
it will happen. It's going to be a slow growth. Anything that you do that's going to be worthwhile, that's going to be a great work, is going to take time. And you think of an analogy of, a, of like a big oak tree. You know, those things, you see the, these huge trees that have these wide trunks and they go up, you know, 100 feet in the air or whatever. They don't grow overnight. They take a long time to, to, to get to that great stature. Well, it's going to be the same thing with any great work, right? If we're going to reach a lot of people, if you're going to get into the hearts of people, it's going to take time. Just don't, the, the only way that you can fail in the Christian life is to quit. And to get out and just say, I'm done. And get overwhelmed and say, I'm going to throw my hands up because people are just, can just go to hell and, and I don't care. But that's, um, that obviously isn't, isn't a loving attitude. That's not what, what God has commanded us to do. Stick with it. Stick with the fight. Um, and I pray that nobody here would, would end up getting out of church but just get more zealous and, and continue their work for Christ. Let's bow our eyes have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the people that are here this morning and for all the work that, that they've been doing for you. God, I pray that you would please just increase our faith. Help us to, to be able to not limit you and, and to have more faith in you and trust you, dear Lord, to, to use us to do great things. Help us to get all the sin out of our life and, and um, be ready for you to use. God, I thank you for the, for the group of people here, and I pray that you would please just build our church with people who are like-minded, that are not afraid to do the work, dear Lord, but that are willing to get their hands dirty and to go out and to, um, to witness for you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.